Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm really delighted uh, to be with all of you here as, as esteemed guests and colleagues and brothers and sisters. Uh, good morning to those uh, who are uh, you know, in the United States and other parts of the world, and good afternoon and good evening uh, to some of us, actually, in, in part of the world. I am, uh, I am dialing in from Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, uh, where we just had an interesting and uh, very so it is kind interfaith dialogue. It's really my, my privilege uh, to welcome you all to Faith for Vaccines and United States uh, aid, US aid and US Department of State uh, site event uh, hosted on the margin of the second COVID-19 global summit uh, hosted by the White House uh, on the role of global faith communities in addressing the pandemic and its second order impacts. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Sanusi, and I have the privilege and uh, to serve as a, as a, as a co-founder and convener and convener of uh, Faith uh, for Vaccines Initiative, as well as serve as the executive director of the Network for Religious and Traditional uh, Peacemakers. For those of you uh, who may not be aware. Faith for Vaccines is an inclusive multi-faith movement comprised of local and national US religious actors as well as medical professionals who are working together since you know, last 18 months to identify and resolve current gaps in vaccines, mobilizations, outreach, and uptake. We are, we are delighted to be joined by several of uh, my colleagues in the core group members, will, which you will hear uh, from some of them uh, today. In 2021, a survey conducted by religion, by Public Religion Research Institute and Interfaith Youth Corps made, made it very clear that herd immunity would not be achieved without interfaith collaboration, engagement by and with religious communities is key to ending the virus and giving us the opportunity to build strong and resilient communities. As we know, religious actors are frequently considered influential leaders in their communities and can serve as trusted messenger in increasing vaccines acceptance. Houses of worship as well are often well positioned in communities with strong community networks that can be quickly mobilized to assist efforts to distribute and administer the vaccines. Receiving the vaccine in a trusted and safe space is essential to reducing hesitancy. So around the world, faith communities and faith leaders are taking an active role in educating their communities on how to prevent the spread of the disease by addressing why it is important to get vaccinated. vaccinated. So how to access vaccines and raising awareness to better understand the dilemma of vaccines hesitancy and resistance. For example, in Northern Kenya, the Supreme Council of Kenyan Muslim is partnering with the Interreligious Council of Kenya and the Kenyan Minister of Health to bring vaccines to houses of worship and encourage faith leaders to talk to their congregations and congregants about importance of getting vaccinated. So my friend, Dr. Mustafa Ali is from Kenya. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's gonna address that. So I just wanna give a shout out to what the Interreligious Kenya uh, is doing. Um, Youth of faith are being empowered in Democratic Republic of Congo as well to take ownership of COVID-19 prevention efforts in their communities, which include raising awareness of importance of getting vaccinated. While these incredible efforts exist and examples, we know it's not enough. It is in the common interest of governments and multilateral institutions to connect and collaborate with religious and faith-based actors and institutions to respond 
and recover from COVID-19 and positively advance the safety and growth of our communities. However, I have no doubt that all of you here today understand the full value of the inclusion of religious actors in peace building. Today, we will hear from diverse faith actors from around the world who have served on the front lines of pandemic response and recovery. This will offer us a time to learn best practices, to learn policy insights and programmatic opportunities to innovatively address the pandemic and its second order impacts. So it is really vital that we continue our collaborative efforts to support a whole of society approach to increase vaccinations rates and ultimately serve and protect our communities. So I really wanna give the floor and hear from all of you from the ground, but it is now my honor to introduce to you a spoken word artist, Ramb Rambizo Ganduza from South, so from Southern Africa Youth Forum. Speaking from, she's speaking from Zimbabwe, Rambizo reminds us all of the toll the pandemic has taken on our global communities and what we must do to respond and recover. So welcome from Bidzo to inspire all of us. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the warm, the warm welcome and, um, and I appreciate this opportunity for me to share um, a spoken word piece um, on this forum today. So uh, my name is Rumbizo. Uh, Rumbizo Gunduza, and I am from Zimbabwe. I am representing Southern Africa Youth Forum. Um, and so this piece is called Count the Cost. One, two, three. Count the cost. If you really want to see the effects of the COVID 19 pandemic, one in three people in the world did not have access to food in 2020, yet we take it for granted because we are not one in five people in Africa who faced hunger. We failed to be the helping hand in 2020, 24 million students across the globe might become permanent dropouts from pre-primary to tertiary. I don't know if you know that learning loss, aka learning poverty, is the new phenomenon. Children around the world are fundamental education this generation who are at readings it's concerning if this does not concern you so let me teach you a thing or two about ubuntu ubuntu ndiri nekuti tiri i am because we are Ubuntu is a life philosophy. Ubuntu is the quality of compassion and humanity. I am because you are. I am because we are community. It is an individual's moral responsibility to others in society because where there's community, there lies security. So as long as self, as long as some countries are wards, whilst others can't access by fair means the threats from fate to act in collectiveness. One, two, three, count the cost. If we do not vaccinate the world and save lives now to build back better together. Instead, let our hearts hold hands 
as our humanity sings songs of solicitude, louder, louder than the clamorous chaos of colorlessness, heartlessness. It's withholding good from those who would benefit from it when it's in the power of your hand to do it. See, Ubuntu has never been a foreign concept because it's the very core of any faith. I know that we as faith communities have patterns and ways, but if we can pave those paths towards each other and sew those patterns together, our unity can form a beautiful blanket that warms the earth. We don't have to be the same, but we can have the same goal to be the salt and light of the world, like salt edifying and provoking each other to do great works, like light doing the good with integrity, with, inten with intentionality and inspiration. Let the light of our faith shine, dispersing the darkness of indifference. It's time for people of faith to rise to the occasion. So when the sun rises, let the sun find the earth already illuminated with our hope. At a time where COVID-19 conflict and climate change threaten global food security at a time where there's an increased rate of learning poverty, count the cost. If our centers of worship don't become the hand the world needs, so let our centers of worship be centers of life-giving activities like feeding programs, supporting vaccination facilities, learning centers for education, recovery, love centers, where love isn't just in words or in speeches, but love in truth and in actions where people can feel the loving touch of God's hands with ours. Faith leaders, Faith lovers, will you be that hand that will hold another's in partnership as we help each other to lift the world up from this sinking ship? One, two, three. Will you be that hand that won't count the cost, but will be the solution to the loss? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. Rambizo, uh, for your inspiration all the way from Zimbabwe. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And you set the stage quite well uh, for us here. And, um, and really, the next segments of the program definitely is going to build on what you already said. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And now I am delighted uh, to share uh, this warm greeting from our friend, um, Reverend Adam Phillips. Uh, Reverend Phillips is the director of the USAID uh, Center for um, you know, Faith-Based and Neighborhood uh, Partnership. Uh, so we're, we're really delighted to work together and partner with the USAID. And uh, probably uh, you know that we have signed memorandum of understanding with the USAID to, uh, to work together to engage religious actors and houses of worship. Uh, to advance vaccines. So um, please, uh, Reverend Phillips. Good morning. My name is Adam Nicholas Phillips, and I'm the director of the Center for Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships and of the Local Faith and Transformative Partnerships Hub at USAID. I want to thank you uh, and thank our panelists for their participation and for you, the audience, for attending today. We are grateful for the opportunity to highlight the role religious actors play in this global fight on the same day the White House is hosting the second global COVID-19 summit. At USAID, I want to champion that work by continuing the 20-year legacy of the agency's faith-based office to build bridges between the federal government and faith communities. Turning to the topic of today's event, I want to share with you the various ways in which the US government is working with faith-based organizations to address the virus and reduce the secondary impacts of COVID-19. Let me begin by providing a few top line points on what USAID is doing to end the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. First, I want to acknowledge the devastating news that as of today, 
an estimated 1 million Americans have died from COVID-19. This comes with the news last week that nearly 15 million lives have been lost to COVID-19 around the world. The US, including USAID, is leading an unprecedented global effort to vaccinate the world safely and equitably with the clear understanding that to beat back the pandemic at home, we must help curve it everywhere. USAID is helping vaccinate as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, to end the acute phase of the pandemic, save lives around the world, and stop the threat of dangerous new variants. To date, USAID alone has provided close to $10 billion to intensify the fight against COVID-19 around the world, pave the way to global recovery, and strengthen global health security. The emergence of COVID-19 hotspots and variants, including Delta and Omicron, underscore the importance of this global fight. Vaccinating the world is the best way to help prevent future variants that could threaten the health of Americans and undermine our economic recovery. As more vaccine supply flows to low and middle income countries, the United States and other donors must redouble efforts to help countries efficiently and effectively receive, distribute, and administer doses. The United States is committed to bringing the same urgency to international vaccination efforts that we have demonstrated here at home. We have committed to donating more than 1.2 billion COVID-19 vaccines to countries most in need, and have already shared more than 535 million vaccines in more than 115 countries. U.S. vaccine donations have helped close the gap, the supply gap, in low and middle income countries. But as the world heads into the third year of the pandemic, a primary focus of the global vaccine, vaccination effort will also be on supporting those countries to get shots in arms. The Initiative for Global Vaccine Access, Global Vax, is a whole of government effort to turn vaccines in vials into vaccinations in arms around the world. Global Vax will expand assistance and enhance international coordination with a specific emphasis on scaling up vaccination support in Sub-Saharan Africa. Global Vax includes bolstering cold supply chains and logistics, service delivery, vaccine confidence and demand, human resources, data and analytics, local planning, and vaccine safety and effectiveness. We all know we are not safe until everyone is safe. It is imperative for the United States to continue leading this effort if we want to put the pandemic behind us. At the second global COVID-19 summit today, as part of the world's recommitment to the global COVID-19 response, we, as faith leaders, must underscore the severe consequences of a lack of additional COVID-19 funding from co Congress. Fewer vaccines, treatments and tests, new variants, more lives lost, both here in the U.S. and abroad. Around the world, organizations like those in the room today are participating in broad-based COVID-19 response and recovery efforts, helping to get shots in arms and working to reduce vaccine hesitancy in communities of need. Given faith actors' unique roles as arbitrators of trust and stewards of compassion in communities, USAID Center for Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships endeavors to enhance partnerships through a year of action, working with faith and com community leaders around three key objectives, including combating misinformation around COVID-19, increasing vaccine confidence and demand, and responding to second order impacts caused by the pandemic. These efforts will build upon a statement from the administrator when she said, only through collaboration can we collectively overcome COVID-19. Thank you again for attending. Thank you again for leaning in on this critical need. And I look forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists and the resulting conversation. Peace and every good. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Adam uh, Phillips uh, from the US8. And thank you for your message. And thank you for the partnership and particularly for co-hosting uh, this event with us uh, today. And we're looking forward uh, to working together to engage uh, religious actors around the world. Uh, it's now, uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure now um, really to bring to you uh, a brother here. And, uh, but before I do that, uh, let me tell you that uh, we are about to embark on a tour around the world, listening to faith actors and leaders who have made you know, significant you know, uh, progress uh, around the world. 
And, uh, and that's really very important for us as we continue to do this, to listen to faith actors around the world, to ensure that, you know, their communities were safeguarded from COVID-19 uh, pandemic. When we have started uh, Faith for Vaccines um, initiative in the United States, um, the first call, the first ever conversation that, uh, that I had, just to talk about what role religious actors could play, that call went to Reverend Jim Wallace, who is with us here today. And because of his 50 years of experience in Washington using his own faith, pushing social justice issues in the United States, he immediately said, brother, this is a good initiative and I am with you. That particular conversation was the first conversation actually gave birth to faith for vaccines. And the rest really is a history, but I'm really delighted to introduce to you Reverend Jim Wallace to set the stage for us as we embark to our global vaccinations efforts. We started with that phone call domestically. We'll start today with this virtual gathering with all of you to make sure that we also share our experience globally, understanding different contexts and different regions as well. Jim currently in Georgetown University, leading a major center there to bring that aspect of faith to the academia as well as he led sojourners uh, for, take, you know, for decades in, in Washington. So Brother Jim, the floor is yours. Well, I remember that phone call, my brother, Mohammed, <laughs> and I remember telling you that if God's speaking to you about this, probably God's speaking to a lot of others too. <laughs> and so we began to find all the others that God was speaking to. Uh, faith for Vaccines, uh, as you heard, became the largest uh, multi-faith vaccine organization here in the U.S. And I want to point out that it began independent, independent of the White House. Uh, it was a faith-based organizing effort. And the White House then saw what we were doing and was happy to come to us and become a wonderful partner with us. So that's a, a, a word about how to organize faith partners all over the world to, together. And then sometimes the government comes to, to you. So I want to be very clear from the outset. We focused on two words at the beginning. There was a problem of access and a problem of hesitancy, particularly with vulnerable marginal populations who didn't have access to vaccines uh, or were hesitant to be part of all the systems and uh, places that they didn't trust, didn't know and didn't trust. So in response to the problem of access and hesitancy, two words, we brought our two words, location and vocation. The location of our houses of worship, our congregations, our places where I love the spoken word, uh, we just heard uh, centers of worship become centers of life and love. I love that. And that's what we did. And we became uh, places with trusted locations and trusted vocations. I'll tell you one quick story about that. One of our White House partners, Dr. Cameron Webb, who is indeed senior advisor for vaccine equity at the White House, he, he and, and a doctor, he would work at night as a doctor Then he would talk to us during the day. He knew more about the information about the vaccine more than anybody else I knew. Yet he, he, told, he told me he couldn't get Uncle Mo, his Uncle Mo to get baptized. He argued with Uncle Mo and Uncle Mo just wouldn't get, get vaccinated. I had said baptized, vaccinated. <laughs> it's almost, it's become the same for us. So Cameron couldn't get Uncle Mo to get vaccinated, no matter what he told him, until one day Uncle Mo was in a car wash. And across the street was the, uh, the, the True Vine Black Church that was vaccinating people. Uncle Mo saw that. 
He trusted them and he went and got vaccinated. So location and vocation, I would commend to you, is critical now globally. The second thing is the religious obligation to tell the truth. Politicians sometimes shape the truth in their own ways, or we say fudge the truth sometimes. Our obligation is to tell the truth. COVID was revelatory. COVID revealed the inequities that were already there, already there. And so we as faith leaders must never say we go back to normal because normal was marginalizing all kinds of people, even in this country and around the world. So we need a new normal. So how do we tell the truth? Now, I want to just quote two global friends of mine who have been telling the truth as an example of what I mean by that. So um, globally, there is a lot of truth to be told about COVID and these vaccines. So UK former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, a longtime friend, calls the world complacent on COVID. Gordon Brown has warned that the world risks sleepwalking, sleepwalking, uh, that the virus, if we don't increase vaccinations in low-income countries, here's how he put it. Tragically, we are sleepwalking into the next variant, and political leaders are still not listening to the medical advice that is still there. We've got to increase vaccination, continue to test at a high level, and provide the new treatments available. We can't do sleepwalking, which we often do. And the other quote is, in Africa, as many of you know, more than 45 faith leaders have already called for, quote, immediate action to address the massive inequities, inequalities in the global pandemic response. In a joint statement, the religious leaders point out that only one in five Africans have received their first dose of vaccines, while high-income countries are rolling out third and fourth doses. Let's listen to that. <laughs> Only one in five Africans, and here in the U.S., we're on third and fourth booster doses. That kind of inequity has to be at the center of religious truth-telling. And of course, the Archbishop of Cape Town, one of the cities I most love in the world, Tabo Mgoba, who's on this call, Tabo's on this call, we're blessed with that, is one of those urging politicians, and I love this quote, listen to this, not to see this as just a number, but as a reminder that each statistic represents a human being who deserves dignity and the ability to thrive in a post pandemic world. That's a word of truth from the Archbishop of Cape Town, who we're blessed to have on this call. And that exemplifies the truth telling that we must do. We must not just serve people. Serving is good. But I often say, you can't keep pulling bodies out of the river and not go upstream and see who is throwing them in, who or what's throwing them in. So truth telling. So, uh, Many of us were blessed years ago to hear from a predecessor of, of uh, Tabo, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, about the meeting of Ubuntu. And we heard about that just now in our uh, spoken word. And that's what we can all learn from, from this. It's right there in our spoken word. We could learn Ubuntu from this. As Desmond taught me, me, many of us when he said, I am because you are. So we're not just providing services, as important as that is, we're taking things deeper. That's what I think we, we, we can do. We can be there, be there for the most marginalized, number one, and do truth telling in the global world. That's our job, that's our vocation, and that's what I'm very hopeful about from this summit to today. We can, we can be as, uh, the sister said, salt and light. I love that. Uh, salt and light. Centers of worship become centers of life 
and love. Let's be that salt and light on a global scale. It's a blessing to be with you today. Wonderful. Thank you, Reverend Wallace. It's very exciting to be here today and sharing the space with everyone. I really appreciate that insight. My name is Abhay Singh Sachal. I'm a student at the University of Toronto here in Canada. I'm a member of ACWE, the programming team for the A Common Word Among Youth, and I'm the executive director of Break the Divide Foundation, a nonprofit that's aimed at connecting youth to engage in dialogue that fosters empathy. I come from the Sikh religion, uh, and I'm very excited to share the space today. I'd love to set up the stage here for this exciting panel that we have uh, regarding the role that faith actors have actually played. So we have an exciting set of panelists. Uh, we understand that, as Reverend Wallace and everyone has talked about so far, faith actors have played a crucial role at all levels of advocacy in COVID-19 response and recovery, and have been instrumental in mobilizing interfaith partners to advocate and support vaccine efforts for vaccine access and uptake. Uh, like we just heard, there are not only issues of access to deal with, but also issues of hesitancy. Yet more urgency is needed by the local and international community to ensure global access to vaccines. And so this coming panel will showcase the role of faith communities in action in supporting vaccine access and uptake and identify the need to ensure all communities receive the vaccine. And so uh, I'd love to introduce our few panelists that we have here today. Uh, first of all, we have the Sultan, um, Sultan of Sokoto, who is also the co-president of Religions for Peace uh, from Nigeria. I'm wondering if the Sultan is here. Uh, I know that he may be joining later on as well. And if that's the case, we'll definitely invite him later. Uh, the other panelists that we do have here today uh, are Reverend Dr. Tabo Cecil Makoba, uh, and Jigme Konchak Lamo and Jigme Yeshe Lamo. So I'd love to welcome you all to the stage. And I'll begin with brief introductions of our wonderful panelists that we have here today. And so Jigme La uh, Konchak Lamo and Jigme Yeshe Lamo are the Kung Fu nuns of a 900 year old Buddhist sect called the Drukpa of Kathmandu, Nepal. It's wonderful to have you two here today. Uh, and we also have um, the Most Reverend Dr. Tabo Cecil Makoba, who's the Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town. Uh, the Most Reverend Makoba grew up in Alexandra Township and holds a Bachelor's of Science degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Applied Psychology, and a Master's of Education in Educational Psychology, all from the University of Witwatersrand. He lectured at Wits University and was the Dean of Nakata Residence at Wits College of Education. Uh, he has served as the Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town and Metropolitan, uh, the head of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa since 2008. He's the youngest person ever elected to this office, and he succeeded Archbishop uh, Nyongankolu Nungane, who served from 1997 to 2007, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who served from 1986 to 1996. Uh, 1986, to 1996. In 2008, he was decorated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, with the cross of St. Augustine for his role within the Anglican Communion. And he is the current chair of the Anglican Communion Environmental Network. Uh, so Re Reverend Makoba and uh, the Kung Fu nuns of uh, Kathmandu, it's wonderful to have you here today. I'd love to begin with a quick question to, um, to the Kung Fu nuns of Kathmandu, actually. So once again, this is an open session. We hope that this is interactive. Feel free to message in the chat throughout the session and we'd love to hear everyone's insights. Uh, and so to the Kung Fu nuns of Kathmandu, I'd love to start with a question about Nepal and your local context. We recognize that the vaccination rate in Nepal is relatively high, especially compared to other areas of the world. And, but we do know that there are a variety of factors that inhibit access and uptake to the vaccine in South Asia in particular. And many of this is issues related to vaccine access and hesitancy surrounding the vaccine and wider COVID-19. Uh, I'd love to learn what sorts of initiatives have you been working on within your communities to address these barriers that we've discussed? Uh, hi, my name is Jigme Konchoklamo and I am from India. And this is my colleague Jigme Hishe uh, Lamo, and she's from India too. Uh, we are the Drukpa Kung Fu nuns from the Himalayas. 
and we are Buddhist and uh, Drupa is a thousand years se old sect in Buddhism. And uh, I think uh, now my colleague will uh, say some things about vaccine. Yes, uh, so when we uh, like uh, first COVID hit the world, so uh, we started with preparing like relief things like food, medical, masks, sanitizer, because before getting the vaccination, I think we need to get the education what COVID is and why vaccine is very important for everyone. And uh, in Nepal, uh, like uh, organizations were not allowed to give the vaccines, only like government was allowed to give the vaccines. And also it was like uh, going to going by age, like certain age, first like uh, only old age people were getting the vaccine and then younger age. And now still vaccines are going. Uh, and uh, I think it's 76% of people have got, gotten the uh, vaccines. But most important thing then was to getting education about it. Like wh what is COVID? Many uh, people in remote areas, they didn't even know the COVID and like uh, when it started, there was shortage of masks, shortage of food, uh, people were starving, they were losing their jobs and like they uh, they didn't even know what is the precaution and how they can stop it. So uh, we started um, from like getting the mask and food and going to each village and show them by demonstrating that they have to wash their hands, they have to keep social distancing and uh, they have to wear masks, VP kits and like how they can prevent it before getting the vaccinations. And uh, like when uh, this COVID came, there was many like many people uh, in our surrounding, many people were dying there, uh, like many people got uh, this COVID and like in hospitals were full, there, there was no oxygen, uh, shortage of oxygen, so shortage of masks. So we uh, started seeing our own mask and uh, giving it uh, to all the villages and showing them how they can um, survive from it. And like, we took food to them. And uh, we even like, we are, we are working on menstrual hygiene things because in this uh, pandemic, many uh, women have like su suffered from this. And uh, then uh, slowly vaccine came in and many people, they have like wrong uh, thinking about it. Like vaccine is not good. Many people are afraid to, getting the vaccine they were uh, like saying that vaccine is not good we shouldn't get vaccine if we get vaccine we are going to die and uh, like we have showed them like after a long time working with them they had a respect to us and they believed in us that that we can like if we are going to get the vaccines they are going to be safe so we uh, we got uh, like we recently got our two shots of vaccines and we encouraged our community also to get the vaccines and we are very proud to say that in our community 90 percent of uh, um, people they have already um, gotten their first and second dose and uh, it is something that we feel that like it was uh, like something very big for us and uh, i think getting uh, the vaccines was so important uh, because uh, from our own experience, we would say we got the, uh, both the doses recently and after that, uh, we feel way more safer. And um, I think it's way more like, uh, it's way more safer for you to take precautions. And I think the other thing which we encourage people to do is discipline because uh, once you have the discipline in you, I think it's way more easier for you to not catch COVID. If you are not well disciplined yourself, you are not wearing a mask, you are not doing social distancing, I think it's uh, more dangerous that way. And uh, we believe in educating the people uh, before vaccines, I think they should understand what they are standing for, what uh, what is the vaccine for and what will happen if they had take the vaccines because there was so much rumor about the vaccines there was so much rumor about covid that it's not a disease it's it's whatever it's a fake you know it's not a pandemic some people didn't know what pandemic was and so making the people educate and uh, letting them know about this whole situation how it is uh, very difficult for us and how it is very uh, like how it is important to take precautions, wearing masks, keeping social distancing. I think that was very, uh, that was the first uh, crucial step we took uh, to educate people in that. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your leadership. We welcome anyone to, uh, you know, if you do have any questions at this moment, we welcome you to message them directly within the chat and we'll be sure to ask everyone uh, later on. But thank you to the Kung Fu nuns and we really appreciate your leadership. And I think what, what you spoke to there really was that this approach begins with education as opposed to simply telling people what to do. You need to work alongside them. And as leaders within your community, you were able to build trust. And because of that prolonged relationship building, when it came to the point of vaccines, you were able to get to 90% vaccination rate of second doses, which is very commendable. I think uh, you know many of the speakers here will commend that and understand that that is absolutely incredible. Uh, and, and the other thing that you really spoke to was the importance of individual responsibility as well as collective responsibility that while we have individual freedoms, we are bound to the collective into the community. And as our, our, our amazing spoken word artist from Bizo talked about, where there is community, there is security. It really sounds like by increasing vaccine uptake, by working with the community, you can actually increase that level of safety and that community well-being. Uh, one of the notes that you touched on as well was the idea of rumors and misinformation about COVID. So I'd love to actually switch to Archbishop um, Makoba now and ask a question about misinformation. Uh, Archbishop Makoba, we understand that online and offline misinformation creates a breeding ground for uncertainty within communities, which generally results in skepticism and distrust in government and others in leadership positions. During the pandemic, misinformation has hindered an effective public health approach to manage the spread of COVID and increase vaccine confidence and acceptance. And, and so I'd love to ask you, uh, you know, in your cultural context, in, in South, South Africa and broader Sub-Saharan Africa, how has misinformation and disinformation contributed to vaccine hesitancy? And how might religious and traditional actors and institutions combat misinformation and build vaccine confidence? Wonderful. So it seems like um, Archbishop Makoba might have stepped out for a second here. Uh, I'm just looking. Okay, so perhaps we can get Archbishop Makoba joining the panel again. Uh, and I'd also like to call out and wonder if the Sultan uh, has arrived yet. If not, I'd love to ask a follow-up question then to the wonderful Kung Fu nuns. And again, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to message them directly in the chat here. Um, you know, one of the things that we have heard um, from you the, to the Kung Fu nuns, uh, you mentioned that there are disproportionate impacts of COVID on certain populations. And you talked about women in particular, how menstrual health was something that wasn't being addressed. Why was it important to you to address some of those side issues of COVID? We recognize that COVID is not just a health issue. It impacts the economy, it impacts security, well-being, multiple issues. So why was it important for you and what sorts of advice do you have for others on how to integrate a comprehensive response to COVID? Uh, for us, like we are working on this menstrual hygiene thing from before the COVID, like uh, we had uh, a training with um, a organization called um, Bala, Bada, Bala Pets, they make uh, like reusable Re pets. Uh, we, uh, we are working on this um, biodegradable things from like more than 20 years now and uh, uh, our guru started it a long ago. So we uh, when we started this menstrual hygiene thing, uh, we had a training and we wanted to start uh, working on reusable pairs and how we can uh, like reduce the plastic things. So uh, when we had this training and then COVID hit the country, whole country uh, get closed and like we couldn't start it. But uh, while we uh, we were in this uh, precautions and we had like pandemic here, we uh, in we started from our inner uh, circle. Like from we have like more than five hundred kung fu nuns in our area, and we started educating them how this is very important issue because. Uh, I will tell you a very scary thing that a, a girl in whole her life, she feels a truck of um, pets, of plastic pets. And uh, then you can think like how many women are in world and how they can pollute the world. So uh, it's very important thing for 
us to work on that and uh, not only that like not only women women like if uh if other organization in uh, if like big organization to work on this make we we can reduce so many uh, like these plastic things and uh, we can like we can help um remote area villages people because they don't even some of village uh, girls they don't even know what menstrual hygiene is and uh, if we are educated we we have to start from ourselves if we know about it then only we can teach them so that's why I wanted to address this. Uh, it is a very important thing for us in the Himalayan region to know what, what menstrual hygiene is. And uh, I think uh, when the like beginning of the pandemic, people were not serious about it. They didn't know what was happening. I think it took a toll on people to understand what's going on in real life. So um, once like everyone was like, uh, there was there's a like like there was a full uh, lockdown uh, for a month or something in Kathmandu also and people uh, like daily wagers who earn on daily basis and eat on daily basis had a problem of food and the villages uh, near our nunnery uh, we didn't have much actually we uh, we are also uh, like a non uh, non we are a religious organization but we work with a non religious um, uh, organization NGO called uh, Live to Love. They are like uh, we are their ground partners to help uh, on the, all these like pandemic stuff and earthquake, cloud burst. So um, the first thing we thought was uh, because then there was no vaccine. The first thing which came to our mind was the safety of people. How would they get the mask? People weren't getting masks in Kathmandu. So we had stock of uh, some thousands uh, because we have we are so many nuns. So we shared our part of masks with the people around our community. We helped around 4000 people, uh, 4000 families uh, to cover with uh, food, um, masks, sanitization things and uh, some um, menstrual hygiene stuff also. And uh, we went to the villages and we educated the women first because uh, to our belief in the Himalayas and I think all around the world, when you have a problem at your home, the first person you would go to is your mother. If she's at home, you know, you will go with the problem to your mom and you will discuss it with her. So we wanted to encourage the mothers, the women of the villages to encourage their families to keep the precaution, take precaution, be safe. So that's how our initiative began. And uh, once we started helping them later, we had their trust. So when we said that we took the vaccination and it's safe, I think people believed us and uh, that's why most of our community was vaccinated with double dose. And I think people believed what we did. Yeah, wonderful. I, I think that approach really shows and highlights the importance of that community relationship building. You were able to connect with the women in the communities and not only educate about COVID and the issues with COVID, not only public health measures, and then ultimately the vaccine, but it started with education about general health and access to improved healthcare. I think, again, that approach is wonderful. And it goes to show that community connectedness is so important. I think, uh, again, as we speak to community connectedness, we cannot forget about the idea of Ubuntu, you know, seeing your neighbor as yourself. And I think of all and many spiritual and faith traditions, that is really what we're thinking about. Uh, and it, so it seems like, um, um, it seems like Archbishop Makoba has reconnected here um, Archbishop, yes. are you here? Yes, I'm back. I'm so sorry. Just as you called me, my connection just uh, went off. So I've just reconnected using the phone data. Uh, sincere apologies. Not a challenge at all. Thank you for being here. And my question to you, our Archbishop Makoba, was really about misinformation. Uh, misinformation has been a big challenge during the pandemic, and it's hindered responses to COVID. So how has misinformation contributed to vaccine hesitancy in South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa? And what is your advice on religious and traditional actors to combat misinformation? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think my colleague Jim has uh, put the nail, uh, uh, has hit the nail on his head by saying uh, our task as uh, faith leaders is uh, to tell the truth and from uh, our Christian sacred texts, uh, there is a favorite text there that says, 
uh, the truth uh, shall set you free. And uh, in my interventions, uh, really from a South African context, I use a, a trusted uh, office uh, which has gained social capital over many years, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the others, uh, to speak into, into the public space, just to say a human being out there is crying, that human being is crying for dignity. Let's look beyond the numbers um, and uh, really attend to that human being uh, that is dying. Uh, I, I used a statement to address uh, from uh, the pulpit that scientists have done and continue to do their work sp splendidly and that leaders from other uh, walks of life and fields, government, pharmaceutical companies, transport business uh, must match um, uh, what the scientists have done. You know, Rumbuzi, Rumbuzio, uh, uh, poem at, at the beginning really hits the name. I use um, uh, the impact of the office to join world religious leaders uh, calling for people's uh, uh, vaccination, uh, saying access of people to this life-saving COVID uh, uh, vaccine cannot be dependent on the people's wealth, status, or nationality, that we cannot abdicate our responsibility to our brothers and sisters by imagining that the market can be left to resolve the crisis or pretend to ourselves that we have no obligation to others in our shared uh, humanity. I even, uh, in one of our synods here, quoted uh, Zakaria Chafi and said, your right to swing your arm ends where the other person's nose begins uh, in a context of a deadly virus. Uh, our neighbors are very important and the virus does not carry a passport. So we belong to one connected uh, uh, global uh, country. So our problem in the global South uh, will impact even those that have had four, five, six shots. Um, and, and that we can't have the, the, the values of saying, let's help ourselves first and leave the others uh, with none. Uh, that is the value that creates uh, hesitancy. That is the value that diminishes trust. And I said, we need to build on the common good that we've created over years. Uh, uh, within the global community. So those are some of the things. Uh, one, one didn't really spend too much time counteracting disinformation, but one spent too much time bringing the pain of humanity, the pain of those that do not have funding, the pain of those that needed these vaccines, and the importance of really building on the social capital uh, that we have amassed over years. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. I think what you speak to there is that we are all in this together, but the recognition that we have to work with other communities, it's not just ourselves that this, uh, this communication starts with. I think that's so critical. Uh, it's everyone in this together and variants are bound to arise. I I'd love to end this panel with one quick question about social media and the era that we were of that we work in today. I know we're hosting um, alongside the White House today, which is quite infamous now for its use of social media. And I think as we think of social media, especially within the interfaith community, it's critical to think of how we communicate with those that not only share our views, but have different views and communicate and collaborate across sectors and faith disciplines. So um, my final question to there are two sets of panelists here is really in the form of a tweet. So using Twitter, how can we move forward in advancing partnerships to address COVID-19 and increase vaccinations. What sorts of partnerships do we need? And it would be wonderful if you could keep these comments in the form of a tweet. So very short, okay. 280 characters. <laughs> okay. Do, do you want me to start? Yeah, Archbishop Makobo, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, I think my first tweet will go something like this. Um, world leaders uh, make bold commitments with proper financing, that's the first one. And the second one will say, without funding, the US will have to cut short efforts to get vaccines into the arms. And the third tweet will be, we require power shifts 
uh, to give low and middle income countries a control over supply of COVID. And then possibly the last one will be, please USA government do the right thing and back a full waiver of intellectual property. And, uh, may and sorry, maybe the last thing, please put people before, uh, before profit and then please commit to uh, uh, funding uh, the, 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 the rollout uh, globally. So several tweets there. Wonderful, we appreciate these several tweets. If anyone does have any questions about these tweets, please feel free to message in the chat. We are monitoring the chat and looking forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Archbishop Makoba, that is wonderful. The importance of trust, but at a global sector, not only can we have commitments and words, we need funding and we need to restructure the way that business is done. Uh, I'd love to ask the same question about how you would, how you would use one or two tweets to move forward in this realm to the Drukpa Kung Fu nuns? Uh, so I think uh, let's all stand together, hands in hand, uh, like whatever religion we come from, I think humanity comes first. And uh, let's be kind to each other and uh, let's spread love and peace everywhere in the world. Wonderful. That is a great message to end off of. I've really appreciated this panel where we've not only discussed the importance of unity in the context of global vaccines in the interfaith sector, but also some of the practical tools by which we can integrate community trust, by which we can actually work alongside people, uh, address misinformation, address vaccine hesitancy, issues of access. And it really does start from that internal recognition that we are all in this together that variants are an issue of concern for all of us. And perhaps this is wisdom that can be applied as we look to address future challenges, as we address the next pandemic, as we address the impacts of climate change. There are so many challenges that the interfaith community can work on together. And uh, to end with some wisdom from my own uh, faith tradition, as I think of the concept of oneness and internal unity, I reflect on the wisdom of Sikhism and the idea of ik onkar, which refers to a universal oneness that we are all connected. And if there is no other, then there is no one to hate. There is no one to fear. And that ultimately we must work on these issues from a place of unity. Uh, so to, uh, to end this panel, I'd love to uh, bring it back to Dr. Mohammed to uh, set the pathway for the rest of this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Apian. I really enjoyed listening to you and your talented moderation. So you are a star here. So all of us, uh, we really uh, enjoyed the way that you handled all of this. And uh, of course, you know, Archbishop, I really wanted to see what are the 10, you know, the 10 top tweets of the Archbishop uh, Moguba in terms of, uh, uh, you know, disseminating vaccines, um, you know, around the world. Um, you know, these are important uh, messages and we will come back to you to get the rest of the six top tweets uh, that we can share uh, with the world. Um, you know, to the Kung Fu Nams, um, also your, you know, you know, spirited message is really amazing. And, uh, you know, you just uh, phenomenal here and uh, we, we love it. Um, let's continue and move on. We have a couple of exciting things to you for you uh, in this uh, program. And, um, and I wanna begin this segment again by a greetings uh, message uh, from Ambassador Rashad Hussein, who is the United States Ambassador at Large for International uh, Religious Freedom. Uh, Ambassador Hussein is, uh, is known to the interfaith communities and he is the first American Muslim to serve in this position as an ambassador at large. He has actually was with us here in Riyadh uh, yesterday where he actually addressed the first interfaith uh, gathering here in Saudi Arabia. So let's go to his message. It's such an honor to join you all today and I'm so pleased to be speaking to such a diverse and impactful group of religious leaders, non-governmental organizations and colleagues from across government agencies. And I regret very much that I'm unable to join you in person to, due to my overseas travel. But the subject matter of what you're discussing today is so critical that the COVID-19 pandemic has been the key health challenge of our generation. The effort today 
uh, in this event to end the pandemic through a collaborative and inclusive effort is exactly what it will take to address the challenge and continue to make progress. An interfaith partnership-based approach to global health challenges has a proven record of success, most notably with the HIV AIDS pandemic, weaving together the diverse threads of society into one powerful collaborative effort is now needed more than ever in facing COVID-19. Vaccination rates have slowed somewhat and we need to redouble our efforts to redirect governments, religious actors, and unvaccinated populations toward the proven protection of vaccines. USAID is Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships wise focus on local religious actors, mobilizing these actors to reach out to communities who trust them but may lack political, may lack trust in political leaders recognizes that many times convincing people to take the right path is as much about the messenger as it is about the message. Religious actors can be trusted members of their communities and we should increase our partnerships in this effort in working with them. The Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships has developed a cohesive approach in its year of action on COVID-19 response efforts. Its three pillars, inclusion, impact, and integration stress the need for including a broad swath of actors, including religious actors, the nonprofit community, and government to comprehensively address vaccine hesitancy. Along with addressing disease prevention, this plan calls for an integrative approach to address the second order effects, such as rising poverty, neglected health challenges, and the loss of many caregivers to COVID-19. Relationships matter in building an effective response. And to that end, members from my office's strategic religious engagement unit We'll travel on a joint mission with our USAID partners to participate and learn alongside religious actors and civil society from across Africa in a gathering in Nairobi, Kenya. This gathering's focus on child protection in times of COVID-19 reminds us of the great cost of COVID, the orphans, the lost caregivers, and the overwhelmed social services, and the need to work together to help the most vulnerable. Hosted by the Africa Task Force on the Vatican COVID-19 Commission, Participants will engage in deep dialogue around meeting the COVID-19 challenges that still face us. If we're, be, if we're to be successful in overcoming COVID-19, it comes down to the human relationships woven into partnerships that touch people's lives. It takes everyone from governments to community leaders. For that reason, there is the second virtual global COVID-19 summit hosted by the White House, which brings together numerous governments and there is today's conversation, bringing together Faith for Vaccines in partnership with USAID. Faith for Vaccines, who I've been working with over the past couple of years, has had remarkable success increasing vaccine confidence in the United States. And now they're taking on the international challenge with the same energy and the same creativity in order to help save lives. The opportunity to work with local religious actors is a vital path towards reaching people who truly need care. Our integrated world requires partnerships at the international, regional, national, and local levels. Here, governments and international local faith-based organizations must join together to provide community actors with the resources to best tackle the problem. Thank you so much again for all of your efforts. I look forward to our continued collaboration and I look forward uh, to meeting you uh, in person. Uh, thank you so much and have a great conference. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Hussein. Uh, I, we appreciate your message. Uh, just for all of you, Ambassador Hussein, before he was an ambassador, um, he joined Faith for Vaccines in a number of uh, meetings um, to plan actually early on uh, how we can engage religious uh, actors. So thank you so much for your message. So now I'm going to, uh, to Egypt. Um, uh, so to bring to you, um, you know, Marita Khalil, uh, founder of the Your Egyptians Dwala and Women in Global Health uh, Egypt. Uh, she will uh, guide us through our next panel, uh, focusing, uh, you know, particularly on the critical role of faith actors in responding to the pandemic second order's uh, uh, impacts. Uh, so, uh, Marita, uh, welcome and uh, take it from here. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. I deeply appreciate the introduction and uh, a very warm welcome to all uh, with love and peace from Egypt. Uh, it is my great honor to be moderating the second panel. So allow me to just briefly introduce myself and introduce our esteemed panelists. My name is Mirat Khalil. I am a health systems researcher 
currently working at the World Health Organization here in Cairo, Egypt's regional office. In addition to that, I'm the founder of Your Egyptian Doula, as well as the co-founder of the Women in Global Health chapter here in Egypt. And uh, I'm passionately an advocate for uh, health and um, gender equity, as well as reproductive justice. It's my deepest honor and privilege to moderate today's second panel, bringing together prominent experts and leaders from around the world to discuss the importance of our collective and interfaith efforts towards rebuilding back not only better, but stronger, fairer, and more resilient as part of the pandemic recovery. It's particularly an honor to join this panel discussing the importance of vaccines and vaccine equity and their role in protecting health workers, particularly in protecting nurses as we celebrate this International Nurses Day. So if you allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists for today, first I'd like to start with Sister Zef, the founder and chairperson of ZWEE Foundation. Sister Zef is a women's education expert, empowerment and environmental leader, youth and children's rights activist, a published writer and international speaker, and community leader committed to fostering religious tolerance. She's the founder and chairperson, as mentioned, of the Zephaniah Women's Education and Empowerment Foundation, ZWEE, and the Zef Sunday Schools Ministry. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mustafa Ali, the Secretary General of the Global Network of Religions for Children. Dr. Ali uh, is the Secretary General of the GNRC and the Director of the Arigato International in Nairobi. He previously worked as Africa's representative for Religions for Peace Africa and as the Secretary General of the African Council of Religious Leaders. Last but not least, it's my honor to also welcome Dr. Amani Luis, the president of the Siarif Hidayatu State Islamic University. Dr. Amani is an Indonesian Muslim woman scholar of um, Andalian and Egyptian descent. So shout out to my sister. She is also the chancellor of the largest Islamic university in Indonesia. And she is the first woman to hold this role. So without further ado, allow me to welcome our esteemed panelists, trusting that this will be an undoubtedly rich and informative and inspirational session. Our panelists today will explore, the second or, will explore the second order impacts of the pandemic and highlight how the inclusion of religious entities must be integrated within a multi-stakeholder approach. The state of the world is a bit troubling. The world is again at a critical juncture where the emergence and spread of new variants such as Omicron and the rapid spread of misinformation on vaccines have reinforced the need for innovative mechanisms to control the spread, the spread of the pandemic worldwide. We recognize with equal importance that the pandemic second order impacts are having immediate consequences on local communities and create a dire need for both a humanitarian and peace building response around the world. The gap is only getting bigger. Women are half of the world's population, but only hold about 25% of decision-making positions in health. Women are actually 70% of the world's health workers and 90% of frontline health workers. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that women, um, that sorry, that COVID-19 task forces only 3.5% of these globally had gender parity. 85% of national COVID-19 task forces had majority male membership. So with this in mind, it is really a great privilege to welcome and learn from fellow women leaders in global health as represented in our panel today. So let me first start with Sister Zef. As the founder and president of the Zephania Education in Pakistan, you are very familiar with the hardships that young women and women face in receiving education. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted education systems globally and unfortunately affected the most vulnerable learners. It's increased inequalities and exacerbated pre-existing education crises and inequities. Can you please share how the pandemic 
has affected education, particularly for young women and girls? And how can the international and local community collaborate to ensure that women and girls have equal access to quality education? Sisters, the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today and for giving me such a wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts. Um, you have um, uh, given a very um, uh, uh, detailed introduction about my work, but before I start telling about uh, my experience about the girls' education in rural Pakistan, I want to tell you that I was 13 years old when I left my school and I started my own school for the underprivileged children in the courtyard of my home. So it has been 25 years since I have been working among the rural communities. And I work among the, um, I, uh, with focus on girls' education and women empowerment. And during the pandemic, we have seen um, a very horrible um, stories and situation women and girls have been facing. You know, the UNESCO, according to UNESCO, over 800 million children have been affected uh, due to COVID-19. Only in Pakistan, 40 million children were affected um, uh, during the COVID-19 and they could not go to school uh, for over one and a half year. After that, when the schools were open, 50% uh, children were allowed to go to school with the alternative shifts, like 50% today and 50% another day. This has affected their education so much, especially the rural communities, especially the underprivileged communities. When I talk about the underprivileged communities, in Pakistan, 24% population live under the poverty line. I work among those people. These are the people who rarely get a chance to enroll to a school. In Pakistan, over 22 million children were out of school before the pandemic, and now the statistics are different, even higher. 46% girls get a chance to enroll to a school in Pakistan as compared to 60, over 69% boys, and 87% uh, uh, girls have to leave school before they reach to the ninth standard. So you can imagine how, uh, what is the percentage and how difficult it is for the girls to uh, be in the school to get higher education. Most of the girls, almost 99% girls uh, in the rural community did not have an access to the technology. So we could not teach them um, through the internet during the pandemic. They had been away from the education completely for, over, for almost two years. Their families are illiterate, so uh, there is no concept of getting an education or to be in touch with the books or learning um, at home. They are not allowed to use phone because they are girls and uh, they cannot um, have their personal phones. They have to use a phone of their brother or their father who spend most of the time out of home uh, all day and they, uh, then they come back in the night. That means girls, um, almost, you can say that girls do not have an access to internet in the rural communities, especially in the underprivileged communities. Then uh, after um, staying away from the education and school, many children have lost their interest in education. Many children have become orphans and their mothers have to work. When their mothers have to work, they prefer their girls, their daughters to leave school and to take care of their younger siblings. Many people, uh, it has also increased the number of child marriage uh, in Pakistan because uh, people do not like to spend more money and resources on girls because they think that they will um, uh, have to get married um, ultimately and they will go to their husband's house so there is no use to spend money on them uh, to get an education or to um, teach them skills. And uh, this has also increased child uh, labor um, because not only in Pakistan, but all over, all over the world because, um, uh, because of the war 
and COVID-19 inflation has increased a lot. And uh, uh, to survive, to live, to have enough food at least twice a day, people are working themselves and they also want their children to work so that they can survive. It has affected mostly the, um, uh, the developing countries. One of them is Pakistan because our buying power was already uh, less than many countries. And um, uh, when in inflation comes, it uh, makes people stressed. And um, when they have stress, uh, there is more violence against women and children. So it has increased in Pakistan as well. During the pandemic, um, uh, we have fed uh, my organization, although we are a small organization, but we did our best uh, to keep feeding people. And we have fed 2000 families during the pandemic. And what we would do, we would buy a lot of groceries. We would put it in, the, uh, in our van and we would go to the doors and we would knock their doors and we would keep the packets there and we would come back so that uh, uh, both of um, the givers and the takers would remain safe from the um, uh, COVID. Uh, but unfortunately, the COVID came to my home. My brother-in-law died, um, uh, died in, uh, on 24th April. Uh, 2021, my mother and my sister uh, had to be on ventilator for 21 days. I was affected with the COVID-19. And during the days I was keeping myself in the isolation, uh, the children would come uh, to my door. They would knock the door. They would cry in front of my door because they wanted me to come out and to uh, feed them. So the situation has been very sad during the pandemic. Thanks God, it is um, almost over now. It is not uh, completely over yet. But it has left many painful stories. It has left many vulnerable children and women and girls. And this is the time we have to be with them. Uh, especially the, the faith leaders have a very main role in the developing countries because in the developing countries, people, uh, when they need hope, they look towards uh, the religious leaders because they guide them uh, for a hope and um, they tell them that everything will be all right and they trust the religious leaders this is why the role of the religious leaders is very important especially in the countries like pakistan also the frontline leaders like myself like like you who are working among the communities who have uh, been able to build a trust uh, among these people and, um, uh, you know, uh, during the, um, um, when people were having vaccination, uh, still uh, only 55% uh, uh, of the population in the country has been vaccinated. And we are still uh, working on that. We have been, um, my organization, Zwi Foundation, we have uh, been able to uh, go to vaccination to 1,800 people in rural Punjab. And... Uh, as um, um, our sisters from India, they were telling that it was very difficult to convince the people to have the vaccination because they were thinking, you know, uh, the polio, uh, people do not get uh, polio vaccination. Uh, they do not allow their children to have the polio vaccination because they think that they will lose their fatality. They will not be able to have children in the future or they will die soon. Same stories uh, were um, about the vaccination uh, for the COVID-19. And it was very, very difficult to convince them. So what we did, uh, we have a school where we give uh, we, uh, 10 years of free education to the underprivileged children. We have 200 I'm students there. I'm sorry so to I took you. all the... Ask you to uh, try to close the, the remarks in, in uh, spirit of keeping with the time. I appreciate your responses. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, uh, I will complete it with one line um, or a few sentences that, uh, uh, what is that? We had uh, these uh, campaigns door to door to convince the people and then we got them vaccination. But when it comes to girls and women, we cannot imagine a future without girls. We cannot imagine a better future without educated and healthy girls and women. So we have to work together. We have to support the charity organizations like Zwi Foundations and like our sisters in India. And we uh, have to promote um, uh, internet Every, we have to give access to everybody on, uh, on the planet to the internet so that if something uh, such uh, like, like COVID-19 something happen again, uh, we can be connected with each and other no matter wherever we are. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, uh, sisters. Uh, firstly, I, I want to say I'm very sorry for your loss. Uh, and we are very inspired by the work that you're doing. Uh, we know that women's burden is uh, the women's burden and visible work in supporting their families on whether it's in health or in education or economically is huge. And uh, the reality is, you're right. Girls' education and women's empowerment are directly correlated to closing some of these health inequalities. And that's something that we must work on and must continue closing this, um, this very large gap, whether it's universal health coverage or universal internet coverage or education. Thank you again. With that, I'd like to uh, move to our next panelist, Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, as you know, school closures and restrictions on movement and social gatherings, as well as the limitations on economic activities, have directly impacted nearly every community around the world. This comes with negative consequences and exacerbated inequalities, such as income losses and increased food insecurity. Being in Kenya, can you please discuss the impacts within your community and Sub-Saharan Africa more broadly? How has the faith community responded to these impacts? And if I can kindly ask that you will keep your answers brief. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to keep to the six minutes that was given to me. Uh, my name is Mustafa Yusuf Ali, and I'm the Secretary General of the Global Network of Religions for Children, which is an interfaith platform that brings together faith leaders to address issues that are affecting young people, um, um, uh, initiated by Arigato International. So uh, let me just uh, start by saying that on 13th March 2020, the first COVID-19 case was detected in Kenya and immediately thereafter measures were put in place to contain the spread of the virus. On March 15, schools were ordered to close across the country. This disrupted um, education um, and the school closures um, not only disrupted education in Kenya but across sub-Saharan Africa. So like 250 million students in sub-Saharan Africa, adding to 100 million out-of-school children before the pandemic um, even uh, started. When schools were closed, parents were encouraged to enroll their children for virtual learning, uh, for example, through the Zoom uh, uh, classes. And as you know, internet connectivity in most African countries are very low, like in Kenya, it's only 17%. And this disadvantaged many children. Children in rural areas especially were the most affected by the closure of schools. And the data collected in April of 2021 found out that 53% of students in rural areas and informal settlements showed declines in the level of their performance. And so generally speaking, closure of schools affected children who uh, in some cases also were finding their daily lunch or breakfast in school. So that, mean, that meant that not only did they, uh, um, was their education affected, but also so, uh, their nutrition sources was also uh, um, affected. In Mombasa, for example, one of the uh, local community leaders during a roundtable meeting on the effect of COVID-19 in Kenya noted that there was an increase in children grants in Mombasa during the school closure period with children as early as nine years joining those gangs because they lacked the basic uh, elements, basic food, um, basic things that they needed uh, um, at home um, and they, could find, they couldn't find that. In terms of uh, food insecurity, almost 21 million children normally in, at any given time in sub-Saharan Africa are a step away from famine and facing food starvation. This was exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. There were a number of other overlapping dynamics that emerged because of COVID-19, affecting food security, including disruptions to food supply chains, loss of income and livelihoods, uneven food prices and widening inequality. Prior to COVID-19 pandemic, it was estimated that 85% of people living in the informal settlements were food insecure. And with COVID-19, those people that were living in those informal settlements even became even much more food uh, um, uh, insecure. 
there were COVID orphans that we saw many parents who died out of COVID-19 pandemic uh, and leaving the uh, children, many children without parents and they had to fend for themselves. That became a much bigger challenge. What can faith leaders do to address this second order impact? And I just have a few um, points here to share with you. At the global level, um, faith leaders can advocate for safe and equitable distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, ensuring that all countries have access to life-saving vaccines for their vulnerable populations. This will ensure that we actually have less negative impact of COVID uh, pandemic. At the local level, faith leaders should commit to sharing accurate, fact-based information about COVID-19 vaccines to enable families and communities to make key decisions about their own health and well-being. There has been significant fake news, deep facts, manipulation of, of, of information um, about COVID-19, and it is the responsibility of faith leaders to correct those fake news. Some of the manipulation, manipulated information or disruption of information, disinformation and misinformation unfortunately came from faith communities, from faith leaders, from places of worship themselves. And it is important for the faith leaders themselves to then correct those manipula manipulations, misinformation, and disinformation. It is important also for faith leaders to advocate for comprehensive analysis of those barriers that emanate from faith communities, um, misinterpretation of religious texts, to, to, to actually clarify what COVID is and how, what we need to do to address the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And lastly, to advocate for governments to continue with the supply of meal programs in homes, in schools, door-to-door -door food distribution in the informal settlements and to the less fortunate members of our societies. I end uh, these very few points. Uh, uh, two religious leaders here, and I'll take you back to the moderator. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. I really um, commend these recommendations. I think it's quite easy for us to reflect on the vast inequalities that we've seen throughout this pandemic and the ripple effects they've had on uh, education and health and food security and human rights more broadly. And uh, I really do commend you for highlighting the important and very critical role that faith leaders have in this multi-sectoral approach towards uh, addressing these ripple effects and towards closing the gaps towards achieving sustainable development, uh, both at a national and a global level. Thank you again for your remarks and your inspiring recommendations. Thank you. This is a perfect segue to our next speaker, who, uh, Dr. Amani Luis. My question to you is on the multi-sectoral and whole of society approach. So as we know, a whole of society approach is vital to ensure the global community mitigates the spread of the virus and increases vaccination rates, closing this vast and wide vaccine inequalities. However, the faith community in general uh, was involved in these efforts in a local manner. They are not always included within the broader collaboration strategies by governments and multilateral entities. Do you, as a person of faith, feel that the faith community was adequately engaged in the COVID response and recovery? And also further to that, what are some of the efforts that were conducted by entities such as medical professionals and governments in Indonesia and the wider Southeast? Finally, my last question to you is how can the faith community and faith communities more broadly, along with other entities, advocate for their integration within this multi-stakeholder approach to pandemic response and recovery. Thank you, over to you, Dr. Emeni. Thank you very much, sister. Uh, very good uh, evening in Indonesia and good morning in America. Uh, and, uh, uh, God bless you all, bless us all, inshallah. Uh, during this uh, uh, difficult time. So uh, I would like to thank the organizer, uh, Face for Vaccine and USAID for having me in this occasion. Uh, uh, I've heard a lot from this uh, evening uh, or this event, this discussion, 
and I learned a lot. And also, I would like to share my uh, experience, my ideas uh, about the, uh, the question you aroused. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm uh, Professor Amani Lubis. I'm director of uh, uh, Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University in Jakarta. And I'm uh, also uh, the chairperson of uh, Indonesian Council of Ulama uh, for Women, Youth, and Family Affairs. Alhamdulillah. So uh, I work hard uh, with others, of course, during the pandemic uh, COVID-19. And uh, of course, this pandemic uh, situation forced, forces, forced us to rethink about uh, our relationship with God and also with science. So uh, we have seen that the hospitals be became overwhelmed by sick patients and run out of beds. Medical facilities for, uh, have been also under pressure, unable to cope with the influx of uh, uh, patients, oxygen tanks supply were rolled out uh, everywhere. Patients had to wait uh, for days before can be uh, uh, admitted to the hospitals. Burial grounds are full. Many people have died at hospital or at home. So this situation makes us uh, think and uh, faith communities try to comfort people and also transform the worship rituals to suit the pandemic situation. And also we see that the experts, medicals, um, uh, doctors, and multi-stakeholders also, they uh, supported the pandemic response and recovery. Um, uh, I just uh, wanted to say that uh, on March 2022, Indonesia was bracing for a third wave of COVID-19 infections as the highly transmissible of new Omicron variant derives a surge in new cases in uh, Indonesia. Actually, Indonesia has just recovered from last year's fight caused by the Delta variant. Uh, that was among the worst in our country, and daily infections had fallen to uh, about only 200 in December 2021. But cases are arising again just weeks after the Ministry of uh, Health reported its first, lo first local Omicron transmission on December uh, 15, 2021. Interestingly, uh, although it was the highest daily new case load compa uh, compared to July 2021, when Delta is driven third wave, total number of deaths case was dropped to lower limit because Omicron variant, variant causes less clinically symptoms than the Delta variant. The third wave of uh, Omicron in Indonesia didn't push Indonesia's health care system to the brink. Asymptomatic patients could just go to self-isolate at home and use telemedicine services through, through which they can access doctors, medicines, and vitamins for free. And uh, uh, what are the efforts and kinds of collaboration we, we made during the pandemic? Uh, of course, we tried to uh, promote the role of communities of faith the organization, faith-based organizations, NGOs, and also in collaboration with the government, local government. Uh, in like, uh, for example, in our university, Sharif Hidayatullah State Islamic University, Jakarta, uh, we responded quickly to the government's program 
carry out the vaccine program uh, to the general public. We also encourage all students, lecturers, staff, uh, academic staff, teaching staff, staff, and local communities to receive their COVID-19 vaccination, the first, the second, and also booster uh, as soon as possible. As the uh, statistics, statistic tells us that uh, uh, more than 200 million uh, of the uh, population of Indonesia get the first vaccine, more than uh, 140 million people got the second vaccine and the booster, I think it's uh, now 40 million. So uh, we are serious in this. To assist the government in accelerating the, vac the vaccination program of 1 million per day, uh, our university, in collaboration with the local uh, government, Tangerang District Health Office, sent uh, 60 vaccination volunteers for three, uh, uh, 35,000 people in nine sub-districts in our agency in the province of Bandar. So uh, totally in our university have uh, uh, 30,000 students are having the, uh, had their vaccine and also uh, uh, around uh, uh, yeah, 100 students uh, in the dormitory also have the vaccine, including international students. Um, we also distributed food packages to students and the community. We uh, collaborate with the uh, factories, uh, manufacturers, uh, banks, uh, and uh, other companies to have uh, food packages and also distributed to uh, the community. And uh, uh, in our university, in medicine faculty, we have the uh, COVID-19 molecular examination, the, lab the laboratory. Uh, so it's an uh, integrated laboratory and uh, we receive also uh, like an award from uh, WHO for our uh, PCR room facilities. Uh, this integrated laboratory service as a COVID-19 PCR examination network in our uh, province, uh, province. Another efforts and collaboration is promoting small and medium enterprises. So during the uh, pandemic, we uh, encourage from the students, communities. Okay, Amelia, I'm really sorry people. to interrupt you. If I can kindly yes. ask you to bring your uh, your uh, remarks to a close. I appreciate that. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, since the situation uh, of the pandemic uh, affects uh, all walks of life, so we try to support uh, the uh, economy of the people and also the education. Uh, uh, thank God then we, we have hybrid and blended learning in schools and universities. So uh, it's not uh, so long the, the disclosure of our schools and universities, but uh, we do it in blended uh, uh, method. And uh, also uh, support from uh, for sustainable development program uh, uh, and uh, to realize gender equality uh, and protection of human rights also during this uh, pandemic, we, we uh, do a lot. And uh, uh, as for the Indonesian Council of Ulama, we have uh, some fatwas or decrees that uh, all of the Muslim the, uh, the people in Indonesia respected and the, for the guidance of worship in the pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19 in Indonesia and also uh, we support the government for having their uh, uh, decrees or rules about the limitation of movement, prot uh, health protocol, etc. So I hope that uh, this uh, ideas uh, share with all of you and uh, uh, may God save us all, protect all of us. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Amani. I really appreciated the points that you raised. I think you highlighted really the importance of the multi-sectoral approach to combating the pandemic and um, having this multi-sectoral approach and a whole of society approach in the recovery, particularly highlighting the roles of entrepreneurs, those in business, those in the education field, those in the nutrition and food sector. And finally, of course, the role of uh, religious leaders and health workers. I think with this, you also highlighted the importance of reducing this vaccine hesitancy as well as increasing the vaccination uptake among students, as among healthcare workers, and particularly among frontline workers. And with that, uh, it is really my, my greatest honor to uh, have a rapid fire round, a closing round before moving on to our closing remarks. If I will ask each of the speakers to share three words, the first panel, we had it as a tweet. This panel, we'd like to have it a bit more of a challenge. So if you are going to offer us three words on the role of partnerships in mitigating the, the pandemic response, as well as um, encouraging the multi-sectoral uh, approach towards recovery. Let me start with Sister Zef. The floor is yours for three words, please. unity and working together um, include the girls and women. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, before I hand over to Dr. Ali, let me also invite participants. You are also welcome to engage with this question in the chat or on Twitter or on whatever your preferred social media channel is, sharing the three words on how you find uh, the role of partnerships in this multi-sectoral response towards pandemic response and recovery. Dr. Ali, the floor is yours for three words. Clarify and put out correct information about COVID-19. And that tweet goes to, is, is tagged to as many religious leaders as possible. Beautiful, thank you. Dr. Amani, three words, please. Yes, thank you. I'd like to choose mercy education and entrepreneurship. Thank you very much to all of our esteemed panelists for your inspiring remarks and your reflections. Before we close our event, it is really my truest honor to introduce Dr. Uzma Said, who is the, she is an infectious disease physician as well as the core team member for Faith for Vaccines. Dr. Uzma, the floor is yours. For those still on the call, I invite you to listen to the inspiring closing remarks from this amazing infectious disease doctor who was also a frontline worker. Dr. Uzma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Meera. On behalf of Fates for Vaccines Core Group, I would really like to acknowledge each of our esteemed panelists and speakers and all the audience members who have joined us here today. I'm really inspired and impressed by the quick mobilization and innovative mechanisms utilized by faith communities around the world to support this pandemic response and recovery initiatives. While we have seen tremendous progress in mitigating the spread of the pandemic and really get shots into arms, we still have significant strides to make until all of our communities are safe from the pandemic. As demonstrated today, including the indirect impact on food insecurity and childhood educational disruption. Faith communities have been very busy conducting community-based initiatives to quell this hesitancy and increase the access to vaccines, but they still face barriers inhibiting their full potential. Civil society must continue to advocate to governments, multilateral organizations, and medical professionals for the inclusion of faith communities within their broader COVID-19 response and recovery plans. It is only through a whole of society approach that together we can safely support our communities throughout the pandemic response and recovery. On behalf of Faiths for Vaccines, USAID, and the Department of State, we warmly thank you for your participation in today's discussion and encourage you to continue to explore avenues for increased collaboration amongst a wide variety of stakeholders. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uzma. It's uh, really for 
your leadership within Faith for Vaccines, bringing that, you know, uh, professionalism. And uh, we really, um, you know, thank you for your service as well. I mean, you have been navigating with your own job as well as educating all of us in the faith communities and how we can basically frame the message and bringing the moral value in, um, in addressing COVID-19. So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for uh, this really an amazing uh, gathering. And this is really only the beginning. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of inspiring messages and we hope with our partners uh, from the USAID and the State Department, we continue to engage religious communities um, around the world uh, as the trusted messengers and, and uh, trusted locations, as my brother Jim was saying earlier, to use all of these trusted locations really to the, you know, advance vaccines. So thank you. And also I would like to thank particularly my colleague, Sarah Taylor. He has been um, you know, communicating with all of you um, I am sitting here in Riyadh, but she is also a frontline worker. Um, she led all of this work here to make this uh, event here. So thank you, Sarah, for your leadership as well. And um, uh, as I said, this is the beginning. And thank you all for attending. And to our panelists and the speakers, thank you for your time. So please enjoy your evening, your time, wherever you are. And we are together committed to fight the pandemic through, you know, vaccines. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're welcome.